What we do in life echoes in eternity. What is up, everybody? Welcome to PCP Movie Night. Sorry for the late start tonight, but it is going to be worth it because the only way to rebound from Cats last week is to go with a winner of Best Picture at the Academy Awards, a winner for Best Actor at the Academy Awards. And for some reason, not the winner of Best Director or Best Score, but we're talking about 2000's Gladiator. This movie right here, a movie near and dear to my heart. I love it. It brought back the decades-long dead swords and sandals genre of big historical epics. They were done, y'all. We didn't care about those in the 80s and the 90s. But in 2000, this movie hit and so many mimics of it started popping up troy and 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 even ridley scott getting trying to trying to get back into the epic game so this kick-started or should i say re-kick-started the historical epic drama as a major force in cinema history so in order to talk about a cinematic achievement like this we got to have a cinematic achievement worthy panel including the missing link himself it's my buddy steph what is up homie what up what up uh happy to be here uh i agree with you this movie i was watching this movie and i i i was like i started thinking of like 300 and um what's the one with colin farrow uh Oliver stone flick alexander, alexander yes yeah he's on the money yeah that, that started a wave of just but it's dope we love that stuff but um yeah um where i remember seeing i will say i remember seeing the movie list and thinking it what a jarring thing to go from like cats to, to gladiator. But now I understand. I understand. Now, now you get it. We needed the rebound, man. And I appreciate you being here. The better half of Supreme clientele. Speaking of better halves, <laughs> the better half of geeks unleashed. The podcast is here is Jasmine. What is up? What's up fellas. <laughs> what up, fellas? I'm, I'm super excited to be here. This is, one of my favorite movies of all time. This movie was so long ago. I went to the theater to see this movie over and over and over again because back then I could go see this movie in theaters for $3.75. Wow. I worked at the movie theater when it released, so I got to see it a lot for free. Oh, for free. Nice. <laughs> it nice. was great. I loved it. <laughs> all right. Oh, Stu, we love you though, but I mean, let's be honest. Come on. Um, and also, speaking of being honest, the better half of Go Figure Reviews. It's Brooks. What is up, my man? What's up? You excited to talk about this movie? Quite. Is it a good rebound from Cats last week? I don't know, man. No buttholes in this one either. <laughs> yeah, it was like tragic, man. Missed opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will be joined later on in the program by uh, Mr. Joe Corallo, who uh, had to be experiencing a delay but don't worry about that because we are here to chat about this movie as i said i watched this movie when i worked at the movie theater hollywood 18 uh regal cinemas it's been torn down since that was mine and brooks's theater that we went to all the time the last movie we saw there was bloodshot so fuck covid because <laughs> that sucks to have that memory but man i worked there and i 
loved what well, I mean, I love watching movies and I love the theater and working at a theater was a magical experience. And it was a great time in my life. I'm 20, 21. We're all just hanging out, watching movies for free, hanging out after we close, raiding the snack bar, watching movies. Like I remember one time we found a print of fight club like two years after it had already been out of the theater we were like oh man we never sent back this fight club so then we all just like we reel it up and we just sit there and we watch fight club drinking 99 bananas that was a rough night um you don't want to drink sugary rum like by by the bottle trust me you don't want to do that but i remember watching this movie for the first time i was getting off my shift and this movie came out in may of 2000 if i remember correctly and i remember getting off my shift and being like, I want to watch this movie. And I went and sat down and watched it and just was blown away by this film. Just absolutely stunned by this film. I was already, it, this kind of, I was already kind of paying attention to Russell Crowe because of the movie The Insider that Michael Mann did with him and Al Pacino, where he plays the whistleblower on the tobacco industry. And so then I remember going through and like watching all of these Russell Crowe movies. And I'm talking about go deep cuts like Romper Stomper and other things like Virtuosity, where he played. Oh, that That's the one, man. I love that movie. Oh, Crow versus Denzel. I know. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta cover that one, right? Uh, and then they did another movie together. They're an American gangster together, aren't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. Which before... neither one of them remembered Virtuosity at all. Like when they did behind the scenes stuff, they would be like, is that the movie where I ate glass and Denzel Washington is like, yeah, I think some shit like that. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, what's that movie? They don't even remember it, man. Like, yeah. what, what a fever dream that must be. But I, I loved the movie then when it was nominated for all the Academy Awards. I was absolutely rooting for this movie. Um, I remember at that point I had moved over to work at Hollywood Video. So I worked at a video store. And I put up a whole display of Russell Crowe movies and being like, we're going to get Russell Crowe to win Best Actor and Ridley Scott's going to win. And, you know, I had already loved Ridley Scott's work because of things like Thelma and Louise and Alien, G.I. Jane. But like this was the one that made me really be like, I'm a Ridley Scott fan like this movie works for me. And when I was a kid, some of those like biblical and historical epics were kind of boring to me. But this one like brought it into the modern age. I think it is such a wonderful story, even though it had a lot of problems with that script throughout production. I had to bring in three writers to finally get everything nailed up. And it works. You couldn't tell. It's just like Casablanca. Casablanca is one of those movies where they were dealing with script changes all the time. And it was just a jumble and a mess. But you can't tell by watching that movie. Everything seems so well-planned and deliberate. Same thing with this. The rise of visual effects, they still hold up for me today. They, There are certain scenes where you go, well, that's kind of video gamey. But they don't overdo it in the way that they're shooting it. So it actually still holds up. And it shows like, and part of that, I think, is because there's practical sets that they use CG to extend, right? So they rebuilt the Coliseum, but they built a little bit of it and then use CG to like flesh it out. And some of those shots, like the one where they're spinning around them when they walk into the Coliseum for the first time, you know, it blows my mind that that's still CG because you're so focused on the characters and the energy and the emotion in this movie. It's such an emotional movie for being such a, like a, an epic spectacle kind of a movie. It's got a really deep meaning. It's got a soft heart to it. Um, and great performances, amazing effects, such great music. The music that made me really start realizing who Hans Zimmer is, right? And this wasn't even his first collaboration with Ridley Scott. That was actually uh, uh, Black Rain, the Michael Douglas movie that most people kind of forget about, but that's a fun little action movie. We should do that sometime. So I love this movie. So excited to talk about it. You out there in the chat, join us in the conversation. Link, tell us what's your overall thoughts and history with this film. Um, I I didn't get to see it in theater like you guys, unfortunately. I was only uh I was I was eleven when this came out, turning twelve. All right, I gotta uh, make sure I'm taking my medication. After. <laughs> after saying that but no I, 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 saw, like, um, I used to watch uh on the weekends uh, you know when i have school as a kid i would just like spend all weekend like watching like 
movies on like the movie channels, stars, like anime and all that. And I remember watching this one weekend and just being like, yo, man, this sh shit's dope. You know, this was like the first, uh, maybe it wasn't the first period piece I had seen. It was certainly the one I took notice of or paid attention to. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. It, it, it did start that trend of like people in sandals, you know, cause I'm a big fan of Troy. Um, Alexander's, uh, it's all right. Uh, Love 300. Um, even, you know, even, well, I was gonna say something like Heaven on, what was it, Heaven on Fire? With Orlando Bloom? Even though it was, it's- Kingdom of it's Heaven. A, it's a period piece. Kingdom of Heaven, yes. That, I like that's, Kingdom I of like Heaven. That There's an extended cut of Kingdom of Heaven that is actually way better than the theatrical release. There's an extended cut of this really? that's not as good. But, like, yeah, the extended cut is almost a four-hour version of Kingdom of Heaven that's really good. It's good. I tr exactly. trust me. I'll check it out. I'll check I it love out. that movie. But, um, oh. no, I love this film. Like you said, I agree. There's, a, there's like, a, an emotional core to this film. Um. You know, it's it's a this dude who just won't fold under the pressure, no matter you know, no matter what's thrown at him. You know, he loses his family. It's just interesting. Uh, it's a very good film. I'm sorry, um, but yeah, glad to be here. Glad to talk about this great film. Hell yeah, Jasmine, what's your history with this film? What do you think about it overall? Man, I remember going to see this film opening night, uh, and then proceeding again, like I said, to go and see it. I think I saw this movie seven times in theaters. That's how much I loved this movie. Um, I worked at a bookstore at the time. One of the guys at the bookstore that worked in like the music section, we would spend our entire shift talking about this soundtrack. Like that's all we talked about. Um, and we would play it over the, the sound system in the store. Like I was obsessed with all things Gladiator when this movie came out. This movie influenced me so much that when I got to college, I studied Italian after, because like I just became so upset. Like I used to be obsessed with history, but I was like Egyptian history. That's kind of where I was. And then this movie pushed me into exploring Roman history. And so I was doing that. And then when I got to college, everybody was like, oh, you're just gonna keep doing Spanish. I was like, no, nah, I'm doing Italian, fuck it. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, I just, I just love everything about this movie. I mean, the cinematography, the sweeping shots, the story, the characters, I just, everything about it. Like the, even the color tone that they chose for this film. I just, I love, it's, it's such a well put together film. Like, and it's so, watching it again, it's like, you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't age. Like, there are a couple of CGI things where you're like, eh, technology's better now. But outside of that, I mean, the costumes are gorgeous. The set design is gorgeous. Everything about this film is just so elevated. But it's also such an incredible story. And one thing I'd heard was that, because like you were saying, all of the script rewrites and things coming out as they were, they had originally kept Maximus's family alive as if like he had been captured and then his wife and son would come to the matches to watch him fight. And I was like, but the whole point is of the movie is like, he's taking revenge for his family. Like, how did we not get to that in the first place? Uh, so it's just, it's incredible to watch it all play out. I think it's, I think it's so well done. Very, yeah, very few like nitpicky things about this film. Yeah, the original script was done by David Franzoni who had just come off of Amistad with Steven Spielberg. And then he kind of hit a dead end. John Logan came in and he's the one that decided that we should have the extra motivation of him having his, his, his family die. Right. Because it, it was just, it was weirdly paced, but then it was the third writer who came in, who is William Nicholson, who, who thread in the idea that, I, and in the in the there's some really nice special features on the uh, DVDs and the the uh, the Blu-rays. They're like three and a half hour long making of documentary, right? That's totally worth it. And when they're talking about the story, he's like, you know, this was ultimately a movie about a guy just trying to kill somebody. He's like, and that's fine to have the hero slay the monster, but the movie can't end there because then just sixteen year olds would watch this movie. Sixteen year old boys in particular. And he said that he threaded in 
the the Elysium thing so that the actual purpose is to hit this goal, slay the monster, and then join his family in the afterlife. And ultimately, the movie is about going home. And that was the original concept, but then it changes a little bit. It's more of a, a spiritual kind of level to it, right? So it's it's crazy to hear that there was so much trouble behind the scenes of this movie because you cannot see it. Like Russell Crowe would like storm off set sometime. Oh, yeah, he he's had, hot-headed. He's hot-headed, and he had never worked on a movie where the script wasn't finalized first before the first day of shooting. And they were they were already filming stuff when they brought in the third writer to like finally figure out what the drive of this movie is, you know? And yeah. like, I know Ridley Scott wanted to have a big rhino fight that they had to fight with him over because it was going to cost $3 million or something. Cause he'd have to build an animatronic rhino <laughs> And he, in the documentary. He's like, I can build an animatronic rhino and it will be very realistic, but it would have <laughs> cost like $3 million. So I'm sure the people in Ace Ventura said the same thing. That didn't work out for them either. <laughs> no kidding, right? Speaking of crawling out of a rhino's ass, Brooks, what did you uh, think about Gladiator? What's your history with it? Well, I, I remember when this movie came out, and like I remember enjoying this movie a, a lot because, like, when I was a kid, I, I really did like. I liked uh, like you know those kind of old, old school like fantasy movies, like Clash of the Titans, and like you know the Conan movies and stuff like that. And there was like a real dry spell. And, and that kind of that kind of movie up until the point when Gladiator came out and kind of like revived that kind of genre. So, you know, it was it's just nice to see like, you know, some uh, sword and sandals, some muscle boys, you know, just just, you know, some good fun stuff. And uh, like, you know, it, it like there were some pretty decent, like, you know, other period pieces that kind of came out in the wake of this movie as well. So it's like it's always nice when a movie doesn't just like, you know, uh, isn't just like a success, but like kind of reinvigorates a French or like a certain kind of film that had been kind of dead in the water for a while. And like, this is another one I have, I actually have the DVD of and it's gold. Dude, look at that slip. Look yeah. at that. It's, it's an actual Ooh, real ticket. gold. Four stars. Yeah, bro, you, you got a free <laughs> ticket to the, the Ridley Scott factory, man. Did you ever turn yeah. that in, dude? <laughs> <laughs> you get to walk Scott through all of his movies. movies in a factory. Yeah, you go through Legend, and then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, you come out the other side of Thelma and Louise. You go off the cliff, you fall down, and you're in Black Hawk Down. You're in a helicopter. All of a sudden, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. And Ridley Scott's one of those. Station. Ridley Scott's one of Ridley Scott is one of those directors who doesn't stick to just a certain genre. You know, like so many people become like kind of typecast as directors, but Ridley Scott's done crime movies he's done epics he's done fantasy he's done horror he's done down to earth movie he's done war movies like he's not all of them slap there is occasionally a body of lies or robin hood but you know for the most part i think he's one of my favorite filmmakers out there so i love this and by the way easy easy dick that is a great idea. If we, we already got November cemented Crow for this year, but I think in maybe in 2025, we do Crowvember. I really like the sound of that. That sounds really cool. That is, I that is like rather. I like to throw my name in the hat for virtuosity. <laughs> yeah, we do vo virtuosity. We'll do, we could do The Insider. We could do Romper Stomper, which is like one of his early Australian films. If Has anybody here seen Romper Stomper? I've seen it. <laughs> you like 90s crime fiction? But like from an Australian lens, that's what it is. I think they're like, they might be like neo-Nazi types or something. I think yeah, that's were. if I remember right. But it's it's actually a visceral film that I think he's really good in. Um, and then we can do Thor Love and Thunder. Uh, just kidding. We're not going to do that one. All right. So <laughs> this movie. We should, the moment, no. <laughs> Nobody picked that for Cruise Choice. And so I, I, I still go. I get to another year without watching it. Oh, um, shit, so there that. you go. So. This movie has a great cast. Like, there's not a person on this cast that I think is a distraction or terrible in the movie. In fact, I think almost everybody involved should have won an Academy Award. Like, 100%. Like, the shit is so solid. I'm going to be nice, because I could pick anybody in this movie, and people would be like, good choice. <laughs> so, Link, why don't you kick us off? What's a performance that you want to highlight? Yeah, um... I agree with you. I feel like everyone in this cast was spot on, even the more minor characters. It would be easy to pick Russell Crowe or Joaquin Phoenix, but uh, I'm going to go with my man Damon Hansu, you know? Uh, I remember thinking as a kid, like, 
and just seeing him and thinking he was a he was a big part of this movie. But when I rewatched this, I was like, didn't have that many scenes. But when he did have scenes, he stood out, and he had the last shot of the movie, which I thought was cool. But um, you know, he was just always there throughout the movie, just distilling wisdom, and he was like, he's kind of like the um. The Rock, in a sense, for Russell Crowe's character at a certain point, you know, you know, he's like, what he hit, he hit him with that one line, um, they'll be waiting for you, or something like that, you know, You'll I won't see, see them, them now, soon, something like that, but not yet. You'll see them soon, yeah, not yet, but not yet, yeah, but yeah, I, uh, he's just always he had this calm presence about him. I mean, he usually does. That's just Damon Hansu, but um, yeah, I'm gonna go with him. I will go with Damon Hansen. That's, a, that's he, a great pick. Uh, he, they redid his his role in the film as part of what that last writer did to like thread in the the thought of the afterlife and what the actual purpose of Maximus's journey is and stuff. And and in fact, they had to change the end of the film because Oliver Reed died like two weeks before they wrapped production. And the original final ending and the last shot and the last words were given to Oliver Reed's character, but then they they had to they had to. There's some weird, tricky CGI, by the way, of like putting his head on a, like a doubles body and stuff. Yes. And I, I don't even really ever notice it when I watch the film towards the end, right? Because of the pace of it. Only at the very end, like in the scene where he they stab him, that is when you can absolutely tell that is a dummy. Like yeah. it just what he, what he says, it like so awful. He says like something in thunder or something like that, right? Which mm -hmm. they picked from another part of the movie where he kept going. Um so, but then they they added that bit at the end, and of course he's coming off of Amistad, right? And so he's really making a name for himself, and has continued to make a name for himself. In fact, most kids today will just know him as the guy that goes, "Who's Star Lord?" But <laughs> whatever, um, he's a great, great, great performance in this film, and a great character that was completely. Yo, can I? Uh... Go ahead. Sorry. No, go no, ahead. That that was the random. I was just gonna say shout out. It... I feel uh, kid actors can be hit or miss for me, but the uh, the the young kid, the pretty much the only kid in this movie, the prince, um, who's whatever, also right? an Unbreakable. Yeah, yeah. I was oh, like, shout out to him, man. You know, kid he... from Unbreakable. I knew there was something about yeah. that kid that annoyed me. He's the kid from Unbreakable. <laughs> yep. But he got in and got out. He had like two classic movies to his name. I was like, ah, I'm done. But then he yeah. came back for um, Glass. And, yeah. It's... He saw what was happening to fucking Jake Lloyd. And he's like, I'm not going to be any part of this shit. Um, so um, he, so there's the sequel to Gladiator coming out this year. Gladiator 2 directed by Ridley Scott, which follows that kid's character. Now he's not coming back, but it's, a, but it's, it's his character like in the future. So like 25 sure. years later. So that's going to be interesting to see. Um, not a movie. I would think that's sequel worthy, but Okay. I mean, yeah. Ridley wants to do it. I'll I'll check it out. It's either this or another alien film. That's all he does now. <laughs> so let's see what happens. <laughs> Jasmine, what about you? What's a performance you want to highlight? Gotta be Lucilla. It has to be. Has to be her. Like, first of all, I love Connie Nielsen because she's tall, and I'm always a supporter of my fellow tall ladies, uh, especially in Hollywood. But I always liked her character because I can't even imagine how hard it was for her to navigate that kind of landscape back in the day when even though she was like the older sibling she had no power none no power whatsoever and she was at her stupid brother's with the whole time and like for her to have been conniving enough and like brave enough to go and talk to the senators and do all of these things and pull all these strings behind the scene i was like that's a bad bitch and so i just love that she was not just some damsel in distress like she actually served a purpose in the movie and she was very like strong and the decisions that she made obviously she was making them <clears throat> for her and her son's best interest so i loved her character I've, i loved her character from the very beginning and she was always dressed so well like i loved the costume design that she had so she was she's, she was definitely my one of my favorites she's great in the film and a lot of what's in the extended cut of this film is her working with that Senator, like behind the scenes to try to like figure out a way to get Commodus out of power and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and obviously <clears throat> there may be some historians that watch this show at some point. It's not historically accurate in a lot of ways, but Ridley said he wanted to do 
like a fantasy version of Rome and some of these characters. And they're inspired by real life people, but it's not actually what's going on. Now, in the original script, she was going to kill herself or, she, or something like that. And then one of the only women that was on the production team was in a meeting and they had already decided to do that. And she goes, you are not killing the only connection that women will have to this movie. And that character is very powerful and she delivers a hell of a performance, especially being creeped out by Joaquin Phoenix throughout the entire movie. Speaking of being creeped out by Joaquin Phoenix, Joe Corallo was here. What is up, my man? Hey, uh, I actually uh, was at a party with Joaquin Phoenix once. Was he creepy? Here's the thing that was messed up about it. It was at Mark Ruffalo's place, and um, I didn't see Joaquin Phoenix. Everyone was just talking about Joaquin Phoenix being there, which made it creepier. Okay. I was about to say, like, am I not merciful? <laughs> maybe it was during that maybe it was during that bit where everybody thought he went crazy and was becoming like a rapper or something like that but it was all for a movie like with Casey Affleck or something I remember right that. right it, it was a it would have been around like I, I want to say like 2014 ish this party you know well, was all right Joe Joe must have known that me and Jasmine already talked about seeing this movie in theaters. So he's like, he knows he didn't have that on us, but he's at a party yeah. at Mark, Mark Ruffalo's house and Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. Thing, so well, we appreciate well, that. I, Mark I, Ruffalo I has a nice place. I interviewed to be Jaimin Hunsu's assistant when I lived in LA. Obviously, nice. I didn't get it, but. <laughs> well, sure. But, you know, that's their loss, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Brooks. We're talking about best performances in the film. Why don't you go ahead and tell us who you think is the performance to highlight? Well, there's like one character that I always really enjoyed, even though he is, he's like, he doesn't have a lot of uh, screen time was the, the guy who played Marcus Aurelius in this movie. Cause like, I, I, I like the Marcus Aurelius character. Like he just seemed like a really, like, you know, he's a, he's a Roman emperor. So, you know, he's probably kind of an asshole in a way, but like, he, you know, he just seemed like a really cool guy. Like, you know, and like he's, he's he's like a guy who knows that he fucked up with his kids. He's like it, like even he's like he's talking to his daughter. He's like, oh, if you'd have been born a man, you would have made such a much a much better emperor than your fuck up brother. And uh, <laughs> so like I love his interactions with like with uh, Cadmus too. Like you know, it's like he's always just kind of being like a little passive aggressive to him. Like just kind of like giving him like these tiny little slights. Like you know, he's like, here, father, let me walk you. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna get on my horse instead. You know? Yeah. And he's like, he's just kind of like, you know, giving him these like slight little disses, and it's like, it's, you know, you can tell it just gets under his skin. And like, uh, like you know, he just like, it's, it's, it seems like you know, a guy who's like, he knows he's reaching the end of his life, and like, you know, he just wants to make sure that all of his he wants to make sure that, you know, I guess he wants to make sure that the future is like, you know, going in the right direction. And he knows like, you know, you know, if he knows his fuck up son, who's kind of a, he's kind of a, you know, not so great a guy in a lot of ways. He's not a moral man, I guess you could say. It's probably not the way to go. And like, you know, I like the idea that he's like, yeah, let's just get, let's go back to the Republic, you know, I'm going to be dead. Like, you know, just give the, give the government back to the people like it was before. So yeah, like Marcus Aurelius. Like, yeah, I really love Richard Harris, right? Like I love and adore Richard Harris and everything he's in, Unforgiven. Yes. Like I love him mm -hmm. so much. It took me years to accept another Dumbledore when he passed mm -hmm. away tragically after doing Chamber of the Secrets, right? But mm -hmm. I love, he played Abraham in one of those TNT Bible movies. His performances are so good and I love him in this movie. Plus, I'm a fan of Marcus Aurelius. Like, I'm a fan of Stoic philosophy. Meditations is something I read very, very frequently. So it's cool to see him in the movie and some references to that. And, and like, he's writing his journal, you know, and you're like, oh, shit, he's writing the end of fucking meditations right there. Like, I'm such a nerd about it, man. But I absolutely love his performance. So, Joe, what are your yes. overall thoughts of Gladiator? All right. Uh, if we're gonna go overall thoughts, this is like for me. This is Ridley Scott two point This is the new era of uh, Ridley Scott uh, because his movies visually, like the directing, there's a lot of similarities, but visually, the way he composes a movie, the color palettes and stuff he uses, this feels like a major turning point in a lot of that. And I think uh, there were a lot of critics 
who brought up that, oh, you know, before this, his movies were so vibrant and, and like the colors were so bright. And, and this was really the turning point for his films, like, like having a more muted palette. Um, so, so for me, this is like the beginning of that next phase of, of, of Ridley Scott's career. And, and while I happen to, you know, prefer a, a lot of his older movies in, in general, just those are the ones that tend to pop up when I'm thinking about the best Ridley Scott ever was, you know, with, with movies like, you know, Alien, Blade Runner, Legend, Thelma and Louise. This is maybe the best of uh, this era. There's a couple of others that I think stand out. You know, I, I'm also a big American gangster fan. There's a few other movies too that, that really Black Hawk Down is one era. I love. I love Black yes. Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down for sure. But yeah, this is very much that like new era uh, uh, and a lot of it really works. This is also like the beginning of like the serious Hollywood epic. Like, I don't think we get a, a lot of things, not just that, but with television, I, you, you know, we don't get Rome. We don't get game of Thrones. We don't get a lot of these other things, uh, you, you know, without gladiator, um, the, the amount of, Move like you know, what was it? There, there was that crusade movie that came out like a bit after this. The, the Troy, heaven. yeah, Kingdom of Heaven. You had the Trojan War movie with Brad Pitt or whatever. You know, you have all these movies that came out that came out because of this movie. And um, there, there's a lot of like um, cr critics at the time uh, who who kind of you, you know didn't like this movie or, or were aggressively anti this movie, like Roger Ebert. Really fucking wrong. What a dumb fuck Roger Ebert was <laughs> on this movie. Like, I, I mean, this is a guy who he was wrong on Blade Runner. He was wrong on a lot of things. And, um, you know, I guess it's not fair because he's dead. But, you know, in a lot of ways, there, there's a bunch of movies that guy really, like, loved that I think really deserve the credit. But when that dude got it wrong, he got it real fucking wrong. And one of those movies he was a dumb fuck about was Gladiator. <laughs> I like how Joe uh, likes to, you know, make sure that he's balanced and fair and, you know, not too provocative here on the show. So what's a performance you want to highlight? We've gotten Marcus Aurelius, we've gotten Lucilla, and we've gotten Juba. So who, what's a performance you want to highlight, Joe? Oh, that that really works out for me because I really wanted to talk about Oliver Reed as uh, Proximo. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that dude fucking kills it in this movie. Like, uh, there's there's a bunch of scenes, and, and you know, not knocking Joaquin Phoenix, but like, he, you know, he he does a great job as this like horrible guy. But you could also like, and and he leans into it in. I, I feel like it works because the nervousness of this being the first like giant role he he had he he plays into that but like proximo like what a cool slick motherfucker who whose acting is like just top notch the whole movie like that guy can act and, and he just does an incredible job in every scene just just a plus it's like hard to, to to really talk up much more than that because every scene he's in, he's great. He's he's pretty much the best part of every scene he's in. Yeah. He just His first nails scene, it every he grabs time. Some dude by the nuts. Yeah, yeah he you know, he, got sold he, queer he grabs one. Yeah, you by sold the me nuts, two man. queer giraffes. Yeah, no, and and I mean that all the way to the you know towards the end of of him where he's given the keys to. To, to Russell Crowe there and they have that exchange like every every time that dude's on the on the screen he just he when you killed. say he said, are, you, are you are you in fear of becoming a good man he just like looks at him and like walks off what's yeah. crazy is that's no one sense. of the scenes that they like fucking jigsawed together after he died really? his this dude is so no good in the way. movie the shit they're like fucking jigsawing in is is good <laughs> do you know what I'm saying yeah, you would have no, you would really have no idea. Like, there's some movies like, um, 
you, you know, like Rise of Skywalker with with Leia, where it's like, yeah, but um, but this, absolutely not. It's it, it, it they did a, a phenomenal job um, working around that. Yeah, I love Oliver Reed, and, and one of the things they say in this giant epic making of documentary that's on the Blu-ray and DVD is that they were it was so tragic that he passed right before the end of production because this was going to resurge his career, right? Yeah. Like he was going to get oh, yeah. so much more work and, and like this, he was about to get his third wave or fourth wave. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And Oliver Reed is, Oliver Reed is such a great actor. And I'm very proud because for horror fest this year, we're doing one of his hammer horror films, curse of the werewolf, which is an absolute, it's, a, it's another movie that he doesn't have to deliver the por- the performance that he does. But he's still like, even in a movie like that, like a cheesy hammer horror film, he's still just killing it, right? Um, so for me, it'd be easy to go Russell Crowe, but he won an Academy Award, so let's not do that. Um, I will go Joaquin Phoenix. And this is the, I can't think of seeing Joaquin Phoenix in a movie before this. Now, what's the movie he was in with the, as a kid? Well, there's a movie when he was a kid. But I, this was the movie that made me recognize this dude. Right. And I love the look, by the way, like this sickly, like diseased look, his performance, that line when he repeats, am I not merciful and gets all up in Connie's face and just starts screaming. (laughs) That's all improv right there. Really, really solid stuff. And it was such a great, great performance. And he is definitely one of the most reviled villains in cinema history. Like you watch this movie and nobody's on his fucking side. Like you are ready. Busy little bee bee speech, dude. It's like, damn. Like right in front of the kid too. The kid's just like, what the fuck is going on here? I love, (laughs) I love his performance. And, And like, even like the little things, like when, when they're at the games, right. And they're at the Coliseum and they're like slaying all these people. And there's all these bits of him like, wow and like getting into it and like making like Ridley Scott in the commentary. Oh shit. Ridley Scott in the commentary on it. You know, I have the blue, right? I don't have to keep showing it. So Ridley Scott in the commentary was like, we just put a camera on Joaquin and most of the shots are just him bored off his ass smoking Marlboros. Right. But occasionally he would do something. <laughs> and so they would put him into the movie. So I thought that was funny. So I, I, you know I think funny about Joaquin's that though, he was so stiff. Cause you said this was like his first big, big thing. I think he had done eight millimeter with Nick Cage before this, but like nothing big, mm-hmm. but yeah, like yeah, yeah. Russell Crowe and sure. Richard. Uh, oh gosh. Harris. Thank you. Richard Harris. Mm-hmm took him out and got him drunk yeah. early on into filming because he would not loosen up on set. <laughs> he asked uh, Russell Crowe to like slap him to get him like, like into the character. And Russell Crowe felt like, I can't do that. And so, yeah, they took him out drinking. <laughs> like, how wild is that? They just got this yeah. dude sloshed. Like, you'll be that's, fine. That's, that's so antithetical to, to the Russell Crowe I know from that one episode of South Park where he's fighting people around the world. <laughs> Well, him and Oliver Reed both had that reputation of hard drinkers and barroom brawlers. But what's funny is Oliver Reed apparently had a disdain for Russell Crowe from the moment they started re- doing table reads. Yeah. And Russell Crowe's like said, like, you know, it's just the way it is, just the way it is. And some of this, I can't do an Australian accent. Russell Crowe, j- <laughs> Russell Crowe can't do accents. I can't do a Russell Crowe accent. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. but like, he was just like, it's just the way it is. But for some reason, this motherfucker just didn't like me <laughs> just like at all, which is crazy. Cause they got a really great, like camaraderie on screen. Perfect. Now, Richard Harris and oh, Russell yeah. Crowe did become friends while making this movie. And you can definitely feel that too. Um, yeah. but I think everybody thought that walking in Phoenix was a little, was a little bitch. And that, that definitely comes through in the film too. Just kidding. That, that's, yeah. part, that, that's not true. All right. But he was actually based on a real character too, that everyone hated and was also assassinated back in the day. Absolutely. Yep. Like all of these characters are based on real people. They don't, they yeah. fudge a lot of the facts. And I remember Ridley Scott at sure. the time he was getting criticized for like, well, that's not how like the, they dig the trench. And they do the fire at the arrows in that opening battle scene. And I remember like people coming at him, be like, "That's not how it was done." He was just like, "I don't care." It's a Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah. It's a movie. Wasn't that thing about him they, the lion unleash hell? It's like, how did they have hell back then? At least hate no. I mean, they didn't. They also didn't uh, shoot Hollywood movies back then. 
<laughs> no exactly. Shit. But so. they did build real catapults and all that shit, so that was really cool. Let's talk Ooh. about the style and the structure of the film. The, it's It oozes style. It oozes the style. Like you were talking about, Joe, this is kind of like more of a saturated look than some of his previous films, not as... Mm not as out there with the colors and stuff like that. But at the same time, those colors mean something. They represent something when it's all blue, like they're not in Rome, right? When yeah. they go into Rome, it's all golden, which shows their perspective on things like out here fighting the barbarians. They live in this cold war, you know, and like this cold place, this stark place. Right. And when they go into Rome, it's all golden. And this, the way that the special effects are utilized in this film is absolutely fantastic. And because they don't overdo it and they mix it with practical, so much of it still holds up today. And even yeah. though this movie was riddled with problems with the script throughout the production, somehow it, like I said, like Casablanca, it comes together as also intentional and deliberate and like it couldn't have been any other way. This is a two and a half hour movie that flies by for me. Like each act is perfectly just paced and set up and leads. And we never spend too much time with Marcus. We never spend too much time with Maximus. We never spend too much time with Commodus. We never spend too much time with Proxima. Like it just, everything is so well balanced in this movie that it's just, it's just awe inspiring. It's visually stunning and I think structure wise, it's damn near perfect. And it's so surprising to me that it took three dudes in a very troubled production to somehow come up with this script and make it work. It's it's absolutely fantastic. And it's a crime that Ridley Scott has never won a Best Director Academy Award. And it's a crime. He didn't win it for this one. It's and what? they gave it to uh, Steven Soderbergh as much as I love Steven Soderbergh. Come on. Really? Gladiator that was just people like arguing over who was going to win best picture traffic or gladiator. And I'm a big fan of traffic, yep. but I would go with gladiator any day, but I love, I love Soderbergh, but Ridley Scott, they owe him an Academy award. 100% oh, yeah. I think. And he'll get one. Hopefully one day we'll see maybe gladiator too. Probably not. What about you link? What do you think <laughs> about the style and structure of the film? Uh, it's, uh, it's excellent. Um, I agree with what Joe said. Uh, this is like the start of really, really 2.0, the second wave of his career. And while um, the colors aren't as vibrant or as previous movies, they still mean something, like you said, Robbie. Uh, I didn't really peep that that cold, the whole blue filter when they're outside of Rome. And then, but I see that now. I like that. Um, there's some. Cool, there's even bits. Cool, not to interrupt. Like, there's even there's even bits where like they're in Rome, but they're like they're on Commodus and in his personal space, and it gets cold again, mm -hmm. sh showing that he's not Rome. Yeah. Right. So like it's it really interesting. Uh, make me go. I want to go back and watch that now. And this movie, just to fast forward to the pacing, like I never realized. Like I've seen this movie a few times, and uh, like it's set like two hours maybe i watched a different version but it said like two hours 50 minutes like pushing that's three the, hours the, but the movie's the pace cut, yeah oh yeah okay okay seen the extended cut but even the extended cut does not feel feel like it's a breeze like every see like the pacing of it it feels like it's a natural progression like it really feels like there's no fluff in this film like it's it's all supposed to play out this way but um style wise there is like there is a scene I really liked where he, um, after he finds his family and stuff, he, you know, he's grieving them and they like capture him, whatever. They show him getting like carried in the desert and it's like the shot of like, just like Russell Crowe's like, like the shoulder up to his, uh, his head. And he's like, you know, he's being carried through the desert, but you really don't see what's carrying him at first. But um, I thought that was cool because it's like, you know, that was like a transition from his previous life into the next phase of him being a gladiator. And then finally, once he dies at the very end of the film, when he's transitioning into the afterlife, there's that same shot of him like being, he's yeah. like almost floating. And I thought that was a cool, cool little things like that. Um, and to speak on the CGI, the CGI is so good in this film that the only thing that took me out of it that made me think was like, oh shit, they use CGI in this film 
was like a green screen film they used where they, there was like this scene where someone was talking. I think it was, um, could have been uh, uh, the sister to one of the senators when they're trying to plot the downfall of the brother. But I just remember thinking, I was like, oh shit, wow, they used CGI back then? I thought everything was like, you know, set, you know, an actual physical set. But um, yeah, beautiful movie, still holds up to this day, t almost 25 years later. It was 20 almost 24 actually but let's round it up it's it's beautiful uh yeah amazing the 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 one scene that always that i do like pulls me out just a little bit is the scene when commodus is on the balcony like looking at the sunset or something mm. like that i'm like this looks like the mummy yeah <laughs> and not the one with russell crowe or the tom cruise no yeah the brendan fraser movie, <laughs> the which i one. like you know but you know those I like yeah. both of those movies. I say both. There's a third one, but we don't count it. It's like Blade. There's no third movie in that series. Come on, y'all. Let's let's be honest. Jet Li was never there. Can't prove it. Jasmine, <laughs> what do you think about the style and structure of this film? I love it. I always felt like every time I watch this movie, it it really sucks you in, and it feels like it drops you into these really just gorgeous landscapes. The some of the scenes that I love the best are the ones where he's in Spain walking through the wheat fields. Like those are mm. phenomenal. The way that they're done, the way that it's just, it, everything is just so expansive. And I think it's almost like looking at a travel brochure or something like, oh yeah, like let me hop on a plane <laughs> and head over to ancient Rome. This looks amazing. I can't wait. Let me book tickets to the Colosseum. Um, it just, everything about it puts you in it. And so once you start the movie, you you don't feel like you're anyplace else other than in this movie. Like it never ever loses well, for me. It never loses my attention. So it's even like on rewatches, I don't pick up my phone. Like I am just in the movie the whole time. So and it's so rare to have movies that like keep you that engaged in what's happening on screen versus like. Oh, oh, this is the part where this thing happens. So I know I can like get up, go to the bathroom or go and get something out of the fridge. Like I watched the movie, I sat down, I pressed play and then I didn't get up until the credit started, you know? And it was just like, God, this movie every time, like, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, once it gets going, it gets going and it doesn't waste any time. And I love that. And especially for a film this long, none of it feels like wasted space. It's, there's no dead time. There's no like, that scene was a bit excessive or that scene could have been like 10 minutes shorter. Like mm. everything felt like it had its place. And again, it was all well paced. Like we go to the battlefields and we see why Marcus Aurelius likes Maximus so much. And then, you know, we're, we see Maximus and his downfall and now he's a slave and all of these things. And then now he's back in Rome. And so like you get to see an entire progression. There's character development, people change. Like, it's just, it's such a well put together piece. And, and like you had been saying, Robbie, like with all the shit that's going on behind the scenes, none of that comes through in the final product. Like the final product is such a well-oiled machine that it's, it's just so hard to pick it apart because there's very little wrong with this film. Even, and like it came out in 2000, which means they started this movie in 1999. So uh, it's amazing to me that it still looks as good as it looks in 2024. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Could not agree more. What about you, Brooks? What do you think about the style and structure? Well, I, I think this movie has, does have, you know, a very good style and like it does have, it does have that very epic feel to it, you know, and like, despite like, you know, being as long as it is, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel that way or it didn't, it didn't as much when I was like, I remember the first time I watched that. It, it actually didn't feel like it was that long of a movie. This time it felt a little bit right. longer, but not like in a bad way, you know? Just, and, you know, it just, it's just like that, you know, when you watch one of these like epics, like you expect it to, you know, to be uh, pretty long it's a journey, but, yeah. you know, and like Robbie was saying, it does a very good job of, of, of juggling its characters and giving everybody, you know, enough time without focusing too much on like any one character and their like plot thread. And, you know, it weaves the, all the characters to get together pretty well. There were a few, like, I think uh, the, uh, the uh, his, his buddy, his gladiator buddy, could have used a little more screen time. But uh, other than that, you know, I think everybody else gets like, you know, just pretty much exactly as much screen time as they need. So, so, um, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, like everything, everything in this movie kind of comes together well to make it, you know, give it that epic feel, you know, like the soundtrack, you know, the, uh, 
just the look, the the vistas, the settings, the uh, costumes, like, you know, it just, it just makes you, it feels like, you know, it feels like ancient Rome, you know? Yeah, really does. Really does. Joe, because of your profession, you know a little bit about style and structure and story and fiction. So it's, why don't you tell us what you think true. about the style and structure of Gladiator? Well, um, you know, I know I was starting to touch on it with the, the coloring and stuff like that. But um, some of the other things I really appreciate this about this movie are there are a lot of wide shots to really establish. Like when they're in Rome and there's these like big wide shots of like some of the buildings and the structures as people are like, you know, walking in and out of buildings and things like that. Just really uh, it, it's nice seeing a movie like this, that, that again feels like it's setting up all these epics that come after it of show off your sets. Like, like really get, it, it helps immerse the audience. It, it does a good job at that the movie the the way it's all structured it's not afraid to lean into certain tropes and and things we see in stories because it's just the easiest way to get you from point a to point b uh, i know there are people who complain about things like oh well it was well what they think was going to happen they had the small group you know, go and uh, go to execute them and they get killed like and they couldn't follow like what they think. And, it, you know, things like that, where it's like, well, they were never going to publicly execute the guy it was always supposed to be quiet, you know, because he's so popular and all that. So so it does make sense. I, I think that gets a little more nitpicky, but but it's structured in such a way where. You're not so you're never like waiting to get to the fireworks factory to to use a, a, a term from the Simpsons. Uh, you're just you're there for the ride the whole time. Like you're like for me, and I think for most people that watch this, you're never going like, come on, let's get like can can like Russell Crowe like just beat the shit out of Joaquin Phoenix already. You never because you know you're gonna get there. The movie is structured in, in a like, you know, sort of classic, epic, you know, hero's journey, rise, fall, rise again kind of situation where you know it's going to come. The, the movie makes it very clear without like beating you over the head, like you know it's going to happen. You're, you're there for the ride and, and it is so good when he takes off that helmet every single time you watch this movie and that is that is a hard thing to pull off i, I think it's the the structure of this movie is something that I, I think too many too many people just ape the style of this movie and that's why a lot of those other movies after this are, you know, like there's a few that are decent, but a lot of them are like skippable, forgettable. Um, some of the saturation choices uh, are what Zack Snyder ended up building his whole career on. But <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, but it's really the structure of this movie that makes it work with the style hand in hand and more directors should have you know figured that out yeah 100 percent. like zach's this movie had a huge influence on zach snyder for certain oh right absolutely 300 one of those movies we mentioned troy even kingdom of heaven which was ridley scott again trying to like ignite it again it didn't quite work but i'm telling y'all the extended cut of kingdom of heaven slaps it's awesome i promise you maybe i'm wrong but i'm not so that, that that's fine um, in that moment, by the way, when he takes the mask believe. off, I'm sorry. What was that link? Oh no, I was uh, I was gonna say I can't believe Ed, speaking on Heaven on Fire. I can't believe Ed Norton did the entire movie with the mask. You know, and see him at one time. It makes me wonder if that was him actually. It wasn't. It was Do the you guys whole. Remember the role? It was Mark Ruffalo. Is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> But every time Maximus pulls off that mask, like you said, Joe, it works. And you can also yeah. literally feel Commodus shit himself, right? Like oh, every yeah. single fucking time, man. Every time. 
Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the music. She's like, what? Me and Jasmine been kind of getting ready to talk about this one all night. Hans Zimmer and Lisa Gerard. What a combination. So like this was when I started noticing who Hans Zimmer was. And then you look and you're like, oh, my goodness, he's had a career for a very, very long time. And it, I guess it should have been Lion King when I knew who Hans Zimmer was or something else like that. Right. But this was the <laughs> one where I was paying attention because I remember watching these Academy Awards and being outraged. If Twitter was a thing, then I would have been all over the Academy's asses. You know what I'm saying? I've been like, you pieces of shit. You don't even know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. It's either this or almost famous to win best score. Um but Hans Zimmer, who's become kind of really well known now, and he's done, he did six movies with Ridley, four movies with Tony, he's done six movies with Christopher Nolan. So, like, he, he, he gets, he, he, he works with certain directors that really help because they know that he can bring something to accentuate it, right? He also likes to collaborate, right? Like with Junkie XL or here, Lisa Gerard, right? And her vocals and every, and I, I, I'm not trying to sound like I'm some kind of like weird new agey person, but I can just calm myself by listening to Lisa Gerard, right? Like just straight up, like it's a, it's a, it's a go-to on my Spotify. Um, I love it. I love that uh, Zack Snyder used her in the uh, trailer for the, uh, the, his cut of the uh, justice league. Um, I love the music. I was listening to the score all day. I've been listening to it all week. I've listened to it many times in my life. Just like Jasmine said, it's, it's a banger. And it's another sad fact that this did not win best original score, which blows my mind. I'm going to look up who actually won best original score that year. So we can all lament together, but link, why don't you tell us what you thought about the music? Uh, real quick, Ted, did Hans Zimmer do the score for the Dune movie? The new Dune movies, too? Yes. yes. Shout out to Hans Zimmer, man. I loved that uh, shit. Um, but no, um, just scoring this is beautiful. I, I couldn't do it justice better than you guys. Um, I I really like the, the scene. Anytime he like flashback to like he's thinking of his home. And he's like running his hand through the the wheat fields or whatever, and then she's like doing that mantra or the chanting or whatever. I think that's really appealing. I like that. Um, it's very fitting. I th Brooks was saying like earlier that you really feel like you're you're in this movie, and I think the music at, is like a big component of that. Um, it really does make you, you know, it gives you evokes that feeling of. Wow, I feel it may, this is what they listened to back then, or maybe this is how life was back then. Um, it, it definitely, it yeah, I, the music A one, I think it evokes everything it's trying to do. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's uh, if you got echolalia, uh, this movie's gonna trigger it. You know, you're gonna be just chanting shit all day in the back of your head. Um, <laughs> but it's a good thing. He uh, uh, the music yeah. it goes from like this ethereal thing commodus has this theme that comes up with him sometimes it's like this like unnerving unsettling like high pitch thing that's attached to it and then it will just go into bum bum ba -da -da -dum, bum 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 ba -da -da. so it gets big and it gets small and the scale is there and it represents all of these themes that hopefully we'll be talking about what do you think about the music jasmine it's oh and by the way crouching tiger hidden dragon won best score that year I mean, you can't be too upset about that one, though, can you? Interesting. I think I can. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I can't because I, I thought that this one was. So there have only been two times where I have paid so much attention to the soundtrack that I got really pissed off. Gladiator was the first one. And when Brokeback Mountain got snubbed for best original score, I about lost my mind because the score for that film was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. Who did it lose I to? Mean, so uh, it was, um, it's a composer. His name is Gustavo. Um, he did the Broke Back Mountain oh. one. But as far as this film, the only other voice that even comes close to Lisa Gerard would be Enya. Like it, I, I can't think of anyone else that would be able to do the things that she did, like with the work that she had for the soundtrack or for the score. I just, oh, I love everything about it. I still listen to the soundtrack. Like, regularly i still listen to the soundtrack i think it is fantastic and it's what cemented 
Hans Zimmer as my favorite composer um, after this movie came out, but they use the music so effectively that it almost feels like they built the movie around the music, which sounds mm. pretentious, but like it, it feels so integrated that it, how could they have done it any other way? Right. It just, everything works every, it sets the scene, it sets the tone. It makes you feel the emotions. And even to this day, like sometimes if you're listening to like the score channel on Spotify and like any piece of the gladiator soundtrack comes on and I am immediately transported back to this movie every single time. Um, it just evokes so much emotion that, oh, I just, I don't know. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Me too. What about you, Brooks? Did you notice the music? I did. Like, uh, this, is a, this is a good, it's like, the thing about this score is it, it, it feels like, you know, it merges very well with the movie, but it doesn't fade into the background. Like, you still, you can still, you still hear it, but it doesn't also, it also doesn't like, you know, overwhelm your viewing experience at the same time. It like, it feels like, you know, a perfect fit. You know, it, it evokes like the emotions that, you know, it, it's supposed to. Like, you know, it's it's just uh just like, you know, a really good soundtrack. And like, you know, I love the uh the chanting, oh, 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 you know, it's great. It's uh it's it's like, you know, some guys are just really good at making soundtracks, and uh, I think Hans Zimmer might be one of those guys. He just he might, might be, be. <laughs> might be a soundtrack guy, you know. He just might be. <laughs> what about you, Joe? What do you think about the music? You know, there's not too much to add. Um, you know. Beyond that, I, I mean, it's very compelling stuff. Um, it, you know, I, I I love all like the fight, all the fight scenes. The the music enhances every single one of them. Um, and, and yeah, I, I did also think it was funny how much of this was like kind of reused in like Pirates of the Caribbean, the Curse of the Black Pearl. But <laughs> you know, that came out after this, so whatever, it's fine. Um, but no, this John Williams uh, has made yeah. an entire career out of doing the same fucking thing. <laughs> okay. So... Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm also, just glad at those... this point we're not in the zone where he just goes bomb, bomb a lot. Yes, I, I I was going to to joke about how like you know there were so few bombs in this movie. There's no because uh, that does get old after a while. Remember what was that one? song it's not Hans there but like there was like a string of movies that came it was like for a decade where like every other trailer had that same fucking song that was like da 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 and it was just like going yeah, over you know, like dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 yeah dun, dun. it almost sounds like the saw score right it's like i know but it like... was it, it was every other mm. like trailer in like the mid 2000s they just kind of like the vin why diesel are we movie, using the yeah. vin diesel movie babylon ad or whatever uses that in the trailer so like yeah and and i'm there you're right there's like 25 fucking movie trailers from that era that <laughs> use that, that piece of music yeah no it's crazy but yeah you know so uh so that luckily that's not here but yeah it's um it, it's just so funny though again like like watching this that listen to the score and all this and it's like man like Zack snyder really sucks jesus <laughs> like you know it's like you know what you hear i seen the um to, to chime in on what Joe said, like I, I do enjoy Zack Snyder, but Rebel Moon, man, I was so quick to like hot garbage that film is. I saw them advertising the part two. I was like, Jesus, you guys are on part two already? Really? We filmed it back to back. Yeah, I haven't seen it, it yet, is. but I, I, I heard that to his critics, Zack Snyder said, just wait till the uh, four hour director's cut comes out in july or whatever i'm not even lying i know that sounds like a fucking joke you know right but no i'm serious as shit like he said that so it's not a kind of a story in a normal amount of time like we have a, we have decided as a society that we have a short attention span movies should not be above a certain limit if you can't fit the limit yes don't make movies or do it right? well, i, mean, I, I yeah, like zach yeah. snyder i'm gonna be honest i like zach snyder there's only one film of his i don't like and that's uh sucker mm. punch but maybe i need to revisit sure. it but i do like zach snyder and i think y'all are being a little harsh but whatever 
I think he's. It's I think he's made enough money that he doesn't care what we fucking think here on PCP no, movie. I like his. Oh no! Like, which no, is why is I can cool. say he fucking sucks. Because what does he care? <laughs> what's well, he, he, he going to be? Samurai, you don't need a four-hour fucking movie. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> but but that's 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 fine, absolutely. But no, I, I mean he's uh, yeah whatever. Who cares? I'm just still hoping to get a gig, you know, as Zack Snyder's production assistant or something. You know, I, I go get him. Come <laughs> nice. like, sure, absolutely. You know, that's cool. come on, Robbie, I'd, you're I'd above give, a PA at this I'd, point. I'd give up comics to work with Zack Snyder. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> <laughs> then maybe I could be like, maybe you don't do this scene in slow motion, Zack. <laughs> just maybe. Good luck. Good luck to you, sir. Yeah. I can speed this scene up, you know, switch it up a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, definitely when Night Owl's fucking Silk Spectre, go as slow as possible. Let's like get it in there. Let's like <laughs> what a weird director. Um, so anyway, um so let's talk about the theme <laughs> of the movie. It's got a lot of themes, it's got simple themes, it's got complex themes. Link, what's this movie speaking to you? Huh. Um so many themes. Um, I'll go with a simple one. Stick to your code of morals and ethics. Um, Thanks and honor. This guy was almost it, it, honor and glory. This guy was almost like Captain America, man. You know, it's you know, it, the public opinion is not going to waver him. He's going to do what he's always done. And uh, one scene that I love that kind of sings to that is or speaks to that is. Um, when he's first doing the, his, he has his first gladiator bout or whatever, and he, you know, he's like telling him to show off. He's like, you told me to kill, I kill. You know, this, you know, I'm not going to gloat about it. You know, I'm just going to get in, get out. You know, I, he was a, he was a family man. He just, he was a, you know, he was a soldier, but he was a family man. And um, he was stuck to his code of ethics. And I respect that. I think the movie is saying stick to a code of ethics Hell and morals. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you, Jasmine? What's this movie speaking to you? This movie to me is uh, saying ideals require sacrifice. And I think that that is a universal theme, which is why so many people from so many different backgrounds can relate and love this movie. Like you can't, you don't get change without something drastic. And I think that this is definitely proof of concept of that. Like it just, somebody had to die. Like the good guys and the bad guys, somebody had to die in order to get what they wanted. And I just think that that, to me, that's what stands out the most is that your ideals require sacrifice. Hell yeah, absolutely. That's great. What about you, Brooks? What are you thinking? Well, I think we have a lot to say about how, uh, like how empires cannot survive without changing you know like that was i think that's like the whole point of the beginning with, with marcus aurelius and like you know he's on the campaign and like you know he, he's, he's like he knows like this is the last thing i need to do to secure you know to secure rome like you know the dream of rome you know he's, he's but you know he knows that, that the dream won't, won't survive if you know it, it keeps with this this kind of authoritarian uh government that he's been like you know it's, it's like for the time you know he knows like you know he like as Rome is trying to, you know, secure its borders and, you know, uh, build, like they need a, like, you know, a kind of a strong central government figure, but eventually he knows like, you know, it's going to have to change, you know, the power is going to have to go back to the people. Otherwise, you know, you'll get like, you know, you get a fuck up like, like Cadmus, who's going to just fucking like just be a horrible leader. He doesn't care about fucking, you know, actually ruling. Like he just, like, I love, I love the scene where, you know, he's talking with the senators and he's like twirling the sword He's talking about, oh, I think I think that you know should be a father who embraces his subjects and like you know the sinners are like you ever embraced someone with a plague, your highness? It's like this. It's, it's, it's all it is like you know, like if you keep up with like this this kind of authoritarian structure, eventually you're gonna get the guy who's a fuck up and he's gonna the whole thing's gonna collapse. But if you have like you know, like once you get the you know, once you get the bones established, like you know. You can start building, you know, a more democratic government that can, can last, that can evolve and change and, you know, preserve the civilization that, you know, Marcus Aurelius clearly cared so much about. So, you know, it's, it's about that, you know, the idea that, you know, empires can't survive 
without evolving, just like, you know, any, anything else. Hell yeah, man. Well put, well put. What about you, Joe? What do you think? What's this movie speaking to you? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, there, like you're saying, there's a lot of clear, simple themes like revenge, obviously. Um, you, you know, uh, why settle for your cousin when you can have your sister? It's another theme. <laughs> Um, sounds sounds like a someone down here in Alabama, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, but yeah, there's there's some themes that kind of like um overlap with things like the Crucible, like the importance of a name, um, because it's Maximus' name that really ends up inspiring it. Like he he builds and builds and builds his reputation. It's like the Spaniard, but it's really when they all know he's Maximus that oh, now things are in play and it, it's his name and the importance. And, and it's like who you are and all that. But but again, this idea of like your name is what's important. And, and there's a, a bit of that throughout. Like, what does it mean to be, you know, Maximus? What What, what is like emperor? It's a title. It's a name. Like, what does that mean and represent to people and, and all of these things uh, around that? So, and that's pretty solidly established over, over the course of the movie. Absolutely. I agree with all of y'all here, right? Strength, honor. It's about democracy. It's about changing. It's about sacrifice. It's about everything Joe just said. What I'll add to it is this. It's about the obsession that we have with blood sport, right? Mm. With spectacle, right? Because what I think is super genius about this movie is that part of its theme is showing how inhumane these gladiator events are, how meaningless they are, how costly they are, not just to the treasury of Rome, but to the moral fiber of that society, right? There is no difference between that stuff and us watching UFC and us watching WrestleMania this week, things like that. We want to see violence perpetrated. We watch football. One of the reasons why I think baseball has gone on the wane in the public opinion and UFC and football has gotten bigger is because of the physical full contact aspect of it. Now, what's so amazing about this movie is that in a movie where that's so much of a theme, right? They're showing us the bloodthirsty spectacle. And we as the audience are recognizing on a cerebral level that they're telling us that this is bad and inhumane and it can destroy an empire when it's just bread and circuses and the people can be controlled. They love Commodus. The people does do at first. And this is historically accurate. The people loved Commodus because they gave him, he gave him these games and shit. Now all the politicians and the senators were like, bro, what are you doing? Right? It can't be all about bread and circuses. It's the destruction. But what's so cool is that while the movie's telling us that cerebral, cerebrally, viciously, and gutturally inside of us, we are there for it. When Maximus kills someone, we're like, yes, we're waiting this entire movie for him to kill Commodus. And when it happens, there's no music. It's like just sounds. And it's just sad. And it's not that spectacle. Because then you see that it's not the purpose of this movie is that he seeks revenge. He does slay the monster. But that's the what that's what he has to do to go home. To go back to peace. To go back to real life, right? And to me, that is one of the most profound things about this movie. Is at the same time that it's telling us that this bloodthirsty spectacle is a bad thing. It's also doing it to us as the audience to entice us into the movie so that when you really start thinking about it, you're like, oh, shit. Even I can get absorbed into that. And I, I, I think that's an incre I think that's a dichotomy and a juxtaposition that very few, very few filmmakers can do. And he should have won Best Director. I mean, I yeah. love Steven Soderbergh. He should have won Best Director. The reason why Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon... Uh, a crouching tiger hidden dragon didn't win is because they did a flashback within a flashback. Like what the fuck? Um, I still think that that's a little weird in that movie. Um, so I, I definitely like what you're not fucking lost. You're not flashing forward, flashing sideways, flashing fucking whatever. Um, 
but no, I, I, I think that that to me is one of the most profound things, but it's, it's part of like a myriad of themes that really tie this thing together. And, and then like we've been saying all night, so weird. And it's almost this, it's almost unbelievable that this film didn't know what it was trying to do or even knew that it could do what they were doing when they greenlit this movie and started producing it. Right. Like it's just, it's just so wild. So now it's time to rate the film. So out of five possible you digs, you out there in the chat, what do you think? What do you think about Gladiator out of one or zero, actually, through five? Because we proved, once again, you can do a zero last week on Cats. Um, with Steph, Link, my man, missing you are, but you're here tonight. Kick us off. Out of five you digs, what do you give Gladiator? I think it's an easy choice. Um, I'm going to give us a five. I... I don't know if it's one of my favorite films, but I respect the shit out of it. Um, I think it holds up well. I, and the fact that it was like Joe said earlier, it was the kickoff or the, there's really Scott for the millennium. Um, man, this, you know, so like Jasmine pointed out earlier, this movie came out in 2000, which means they had to have started filming this in 99. So this movie's 25 years old, technically going on 25. So. And the fact that it still holds up so well, and you know it, it like, I don't know verbatim what you said earlier, Jasmine, but you said it, could, it transcends so many different cultures, or so many people can relate to it. I think that just you know it reinforces its five statement. It, it it's five rating for me. Um, just a beautiful, great, fantastic film that, it, you know, it's universal within its themes, and uh, it's epic. Hell yeah, Dude. you're right. It was universal. And then they sold it to Paramount. So now it's a Paramount movie. But uh <laughs> <laughs> Joe, okay, we got a perfect score from Steph. What about you, Jasmine? What are you thinking? Five. It's gotta be five. Uh it is my second favorite film of all time. Uh my first favorite film, Sports Gum. I don't want to hear no shit though. Um, but Gladiator, it's <laughs> it's just near perfect to me. The music, the casting, the script, the Fight choreography, like everything clicks. Everything clicks in this movie. So five. Five you digs. Absolutely. Two perfect scores so far. Brooks, do you keeping the trend alive or are you gonna dock it down for some reason? Well, yeah, I give us one five too. And like the, the fact that like, you know, this is a movie so long and like these days, like a movie this long, like it's hard for me to get through it without like it being at least a little bit drowsy by the end. But I wasn't in this movie. Like this movie kept me, it kept me awake and engaged. I was entertained, and uh, you know, it deserves respect for that. I believe. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. What are you thinking? Uh, five. It's it's hard not to give this a five. Um, yeah, it, it does everything it's trying to do. It's uh, a, a longer movie that doesn't feel its runtime. It looks good. I don't know what more you, you really could want from a movie. So so it's like, where are you docking points, you know? So, five. Well, maybe historical accuracy, Joe. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, again, they didn't, uh, they didn't shoot uh, Hollywood movies. And, uh, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't used to only have, like, 2,000 like uh, extras in the Coliseum and fill out the rest with CGI back then. So, yeah, you're right. This is, this movie is, you know, we talked about so many things about the movie that stand the test of time, how it actually supersedes its production troubles and becomes like one of those things like, like Casablanca, where it's like Casablanca should not be as good as it is. Right. And maybe some people think it's overrated, but like with all the trouble behind the scenes on that one, that movie should not be member like remembered today. Membered should be membered yeah. today. But <laughs> Gladiator's kind of the same way, and it's got an impact. It's it changed cinema. It took a genre that was dead for decades and brought it back in spectacular fashion. And I know a lot of people still today they get all snooty about it, and they're like, "Well, in 2000 there wasn't a lot of good movies, so that's why Gladiator won." Traffic, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Almost Famous. Get the fuck out of here. Gladiator won for a reason. I'm giving it five. Five you digs from five members here on the panel. 
or a PCP average of five, you digs station. That's a perfect score. And shame on the Academy for not giving Ridley Scott the uh, fucking best director there. In fact, you're going to have to pick a shitty Ridley Scott film now to give him best director of. That's what's yes. going to happen. It always happens. Martin Scorsese didn't win for Raging Bull, so they gave it to him for The Departed. You know Denzel and Training Day? Of all Den the fucking films that Denzel should have won for, he, he won didn't for win Training in Day? He didn't win it in Malcolm X, so they're going to give it to him in Training Day? Get the fuck out of here. You're, you're, you're losing your minds, people. Like, come on. Wasn't he up against... Was he up against... Uh, Tom Hanks in Philadelphia for that one, I think, was what was up, right? For that year, I think they were. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Wait, when's the last time y'all watched Philadelphia? Okay, I think. <laughs> Wasn't Denzel in Philadelphia? Uh, how, about, how about this one, though? When When's the last time you thought of, let alone watched, Chocolat? I like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a one and done movie. But 2007 or whatever the fuck, whenever it came out. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, oh, way not not recently. It, you know, it's like this is. Uh, but I think you just inspired know. a PCP movie night next year. <laughs> but that's hey, over, uh, his, over his performance in Benny and June. Benny and June. I mean, he was so good in Benny and June. So much better in that than he was in Chocolat. You're right. I'm talking Johnny Depp, right? Are you? Are we? Are we saying that the Academy Awards are, are shit? <laughs> well, here, here's another one. How? When is the last time you heard anyone talk about what was it? The artist that like uh, silent era throwback that like won a bunch of Oscars oh, yeah. like over a decade ago, and then immediately everyone stopped talking about it like at the same time, <laughs> and we all just forgot it ever happened. Well, how? I'll give you. I'll do you one better. <laughs> When's the last time anybody thought of the English patient without thinking of the fucking Seinfeld bit? You know? It stinks. So there you go. It stinks. <laughs> mm -hmm. That movie does blow, right? And the King's Speech is like <laughs> English patient part two to me, man. I'm just like, get the fuck out of here with that. Like, because he's got a stutter. Like, and then Beautiful Mind. I said this at the beginning of the show. Beautiful Mind's a piece of shit movie. I don't know. I don't care. And Ridley Scott lost Best Director so again the next year to Ron Howard for that fucking movie. Oh, it's like clever because he's not there. Fight Club did that like two years before. Get the fuck out of here. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. All right. Next week. So to rebound from Cats, we had to do this. So the only way to follow up Gladiator is with another established cinema classic that even has a grander legacy that is truly original that inspired so much films in a genre that's not even the genre that this film is we're talking about akira kurosawa's yo jimbo next week y'all <laughs> yes i always love it when we have a kurosawa night like it's just yes. great it's we've done hidden fortress we did seven samurai now we're doing yo jimbo and there's so many more to cover y'all if you've never seen yo jimbo check it out where is it streaming let's check it out maybe it, was it probably on the Criterion channel, maybe? or It might be on Max. I know a bunch of uh, Kurosawa's on there, because that, that's where yeah. I recently, uh, the past few months or so, I watched you know, Seven Samurai and Hidden Fortress. They're both on there. So Nice. Maybe. It is on Max. So if you got Max, there it is. But you can also rent it from Apple TV, YouTube, Amazon Prime, things like that. So it's definitely worth watching, and it's going to be a great, great time. Steph, my man, the missing link. Thank you so much for being here. What's coming up for you, brother? Uh, Wednesdays, 9.30, uh, Stu and I will be a Supreme Clientel over at Dr. Doom's Fan Club YouTube. Um, talking about Reminder's Cat uh, this week on top of. Not even going to try to remember the three current books we're going over. Void Arrivals is one of them. And Sacrificers is another. But um, we're going to be going over some books from last week and uh, going over Rick Reminder's 2012 our captain america with jr jr and uh yeah yeah you know, it's always a great conversation come say hello all oh, the dimension z stuff i really like that man yes that stuff like reminds yeah. me of like when kirby came back the third time to do captain america and made it all weird and sci-fi right yeah. like in the 70s <laughs> i love that i love it hell yeah everybody go check out supreme clientele can somebody please throw the link out to dr doom's fan club so everybody can get up on that jasmine the better half of geeks unleashed thank you so much for being here it's always a pleasure you're not on enough of these things jasmine we need you on some more so uh please uh we'll be sending out the action fest list soon and i know that i got some stuff on that list that you're going to want to join for so thank okay. you for being here once again but final thoughts what you got coming up 
Thank you for having me. It's always fun hanging out with the fellows. Uh, so right now, me and Mark on Geeks Unleashed, we are in the beginnings of our gargantuan X-Men film run. We are doing every single X-Men film in the lead up to Deadpool 3. Uh, and when I say every single film, I mean every single one, including Generation X. Um, so oh. definitely <laughs> come and check us out. Give us a listen for that. Uh, that's pretty much we're working on that through, like I said, up until Deadpool 3. So, Hell yeah. Very uh, Y'all already done the Generation X one, haven't you? Yeah, we had Link on for that one. <laughs> Link and Fable. <laughs> Where I was, the fuck y'all even find I was just thinking on? about my score on that one. <laughs> It's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. You can find it on YouTube. Oh, nice. I was way too kind with my my score with that one. Uh, I want to <laughs> retroactively change. Yeah. Link's getting regretful now. He's like, man. <laughs> <laughs> no take backs, man. No take backs. Yeah. David <laughs> Hasselhoff's shield is next, man. Let's do that. Let's see what happens. Brooks, thank you so much for being here. What's coming up for you guys? Oh, yeah. Well, I do this go figure review thing with this other guy who's mysteriously absent. But, you know, we did... We did a slew of videos recently. One was the, uh, yeah, the two pack, the Lalandra Brood Wolverine two pack, nice. and uh, uh, the uh, the Wolverine Cowboy Wolverine and Sabretooth one. And we also did uh, the Street Fighter Ken, which was a, like, oh. they're all they're all winners, you know. Why does that look like He Man? Well, yeah, that's what my like. No, right? The, my niece and nephew, and they're like, yeah, look at those eyebrows. Yeah. Kid. Ken's always had those like gigantic pointy eyebrows, but yeah, um, like uh, but uh, there's one bit of advice I got from this movie is that when you're buying giraffes, let the buyer beware. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget about the giraffe line, and it kind of always cracks me up. As wrong as it is, man, I love it. I love it, Joe. What are the odds that the, both of the giraffes are gay? Like, what? Right? <laughs> well, the maybe, maybe is definitely part of. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, it's natural. So, yeah. <laughs> Joe, no, for thank sure, you for being here. What you got coming up? That's right. Well, um, in a few weeks, so April 24th is the King Arthur and the Knights of Justice. That's going to be out. People are going to be able to get it. It's, um, it, you know, a uh, YA graphic novel, direct graphic novel. Uh, it's uh, retailing for uh, 14.99. 124 pages of uh, content with some bonus material, but it is a reboot of the 90s cartoon. It's all licensed through 41 oh. Entertainment. Um, so, so yeah, and uh, I, I'm really excited for people to check this out. Then in June, on June 4th, is my DC Comics debut with the uh, DC Pride, a celebration of Rachel Pollock uh, that has an original story by myself, Ry Hickman, and uh, John Workman uh, coming back to letter uh, this uh, sort of Doom Patrol story featuring uh, the character Coagula uh, that uh, Rachel had created. Uh, it also reprints the um, Doom Patrol number 70, which is the first appearance of Coagula and Codpiece, and for the very first time, reprints what I believe is Mike Allred's first DC credit, Brother Power the Geek from Vertigo Visions. It's an oversized 56-page story. So you're basically getting three issues worth of Mike Allred in this thing, too. So, uh, And it's one of my favorite uh, issues of a comic that Rachel ever wrote. Uh, I, I, I really hope uh, people go and check that out. Yes, I'm very yeah. excited for that, bro. 100%. Thank you. Can we get a Geeks Unleashed link, please, in the chat, too? The podcast Jasmine's a part of. Um, here on the channel, like I said, we got Yojimbo tomorrow or next week on PCP Movie Night. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm dropping my uh, top down look at the Transformers number one from 1984. So that's cool. I like first time yes. reading it. I was like, I'm all up on this Daniel Warren Johnson stuff. So I was like, let's go back to the original first Transformers comic and see what we can get. Um, but man, what a great conversation. Cannot wait to have an exciting panel for next week for Yo Jimbo. I believe we got me, Jelani, if he shows up, if he's not scared after cats, Brooks, Joe, Mike, and Stu 
will be joining us. The lesser half of Supreme <laughs> Climb. All right. So we're dipping out. Very Thank nice. you all so much. And remember, station, pop, pop, boom. And when you think of PCP, you got to ask yourself the question. Are you not entertained? <laughs>